Welcome everyone and Happy New Year! Oh, you all look so beautiful. I'm excited to see you. My name is Xavia Bailey and I am your president for 2020 and I'm excited about this year and we're going to start with our Pledge of Allegiance with a Cadet Ing from Sarasota Military Academy. Please give them a round of applause. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If you would please place your heart over your, if you would please place your hand over your heart in our nation. Gotcha. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You did great. Huh? Go ahead. Please give him a round of applause. Hey, that's not easy. Do we have any veterans or active duty members in the audience? We'd like to make sure that please stand. Please stand so we can give you a round of applause and thank you for your service. Thank you so much. Next, I would like to recognize our dignitaries and also our candidates that are running for office. We have Misty Servia, Manatee County Commissioner, District 4, Mike Bennett, Supervisor of Elections, Bill Sanders, Bradenton City Council, Sherry Corrier, County Administrator. And we have candidates for office. We have Sheriff Wells, he's up for re-election. We have George Cruz, County Commission Seat District 1. We have Charles Smith, Mayor of Palmetto, and Paul Feiner. He's running for District 7 at large seat. Please give everyone a round of applause. Thank you for even stepping up. Right now, I would like everyone to please silence your cell phones. If you think you silenced them, please check again. because I'll give you that look if I see it going off. <laughs> so our topic today for 2020 law enforcement update, our speakers are going to be Chief Josh Kramer, Assistant Chief of Police for Bradenton Police Department. Please give him a round of applause. We have the Honorable Misty Servia, Commissioner, Manatee County, District 4. Chief William Tokacher, Chief of Police, City of Holmes Beach. We have Captain Lorenzo Waiters, the Palmetto Police Department, the City of Palmetto, the Captain. Did I say Captain? Okay. And Sheriff Rick, Rick Wells, Sheriff of Manatee County. Now I have decided to cut down the bios. Um, we have been putting the bios online. So once we post the bios of our speaker, please go to our website if you want to read about the panelists. Um, this allows us to have a little bit more time. Our first speaker would be Chief Josh Kramer. Thank you very much. Thanks for really for having all of us here today. I'll speak first. Um, I'm here on behalf of Chief Melanie Bevan, our Chief of Police. Uh, she cannot be here today because she's at Leadership Florida. Please don't feel bad for her. She's not missing out. It's really cold up in Jacksonville too. Uh, for basically for the Brayden Police Department, we have 120 sworn officers. Uh, we uh, patrol the city limits of Bradenton. We assist the sheriff's office, Palmetto, with investigations that cross uh, the boundaries of all of our jurisdictions. For us, in 2019, our UCR crime, we're putting our final numbers together, about to report it off to the FDLE, but our crime stats are down 6.4%. Uh, those numbers are closer to what we had in 2017. I think last year when we got up here and spoke, 
the sheriff and uh, Chief Bevan both indicated crime was up in our municipalities in, uh, in the county. Um, mainly, uh, the biggest things we found are larcenies. Uh, lock it or lose it, that's the whole thing. If you uh, think about car break-ins, car burglaries, that's really what fuels a lot of it. Um, part of that is uh, really crimes of opportunity for people. Uh, the criminals are out there. Uh, sometimes they're just see an open car. You'll have people go into neighborhoods and see what's available that they want that you have, and then they make it theirs. Uh, for reducing crime, we can't really take credit unless we also take the blame. Um, we don't really see a lot of blame in why crime went up. Uh, we have officers and detectives who are out there dedicated doing their jobs. Um, we also partner with the communities and really the, the neighborhoods are where we like to make our inroads. We have our officers every week, multiple meetings per week, go to every homeowners association meeting anywhere in the city. Uh, we get up and speak for a few minutes beforehand, take any questions, sort of let them know about little crime trends that might be happening in their, in their neighborhoods. Uh, also, any type of uh, questions they may have. Uh, and then we go out and patrol their neighborhood because all those people are at the meeting. So we uh, try to make it all work out. Um, this year we had significantly more drug arrests. I know there was uh, some talk last year, uh, you can't really arrest your way out of a problem. And we didn't make arrests with the drug users, we made arrests of the drug dealers. And that was partnerships with all the local agencies, primarily the sheriff's office. Um, because again, those investigations all run together. They're, if you go out west, the cookie cutter boundaries between city and, and county are really one side of the street city, the other side's county. The bad guys don't know what the boundaries are. Sometimes they do, but we're all out trying to get them. Um, those investigations basically are using interdiction techniques we've used through in the past, but also new techniques we're using uh, a lot of interdiction before the drugs even get to the dealers, uh, which really helps. Um, with that increase in arrest came a decrease in our opioid-related overdoses and deaths last year. Uh, we had 162 overdoses in the city, opioid-related, uh, 10 deaths. Uh, but one thing we're also doing to help aid in that, and it was really something we saw as a really a moral issue that we couldn't just stand by and not deal with it. Uh, we have, and I think all the agencies in the county now have Narcan that we use. Uh, if we arrive on a scene and we arrive, we get dispatched to any call that the fire department gets called to. We'll come out and uh, administer the Narcan. Usually get that started. Um, if another officer shows up and the Narcan doesn't work the first time, they may uh, give them another hit. And then uh, hopefully by then EMS or BFD, the medical professionals are there and we can start that process to hopefully save that life. Uh, another thing we've done that really is community-based but also helps us is social media. We have fully embraced, gone full tilt in on social media. Um, we have uh, a very robust f Facebook campaign uh, where we get out our message because a lot of times the local media just is overwhelmed with stories and they can't necessarily put out all the good. They put a lot of the bad out, but they can't always put all the good out. And this way we can, we, we put the message out to the public, they interpret it how they interpret it, and it goes from there. Uh, I encourage you to visit our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages if you haven't. Um, and I have a photo over there, I'm gonna grab that real quick. Time up, almost. Uh, that's a picture of Officer Ken McGowan, KB McGowan, at uh, the Highland Lake Subdivision at National Night Out. Um, with Ms. Mary Greenleaf and our canine Maverick. Uh, that's an actually award-winning photo uh, that we put in for the cops uh, office, had a nationwide community-oriented policing in action contest. And that really shows what it is. We get out there in the public at the meetings and uh, go from there. I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Josh Kramer. Please give him a round, another round of applause.
Next, we will hear from the Honorable Misty Servia. Good afternoon, Tiger Bay, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. I want to start out by acknowledging our Sheriff's Office, because when we're talking about public safety, let me tell you, these guys are outstanding, and since, and, and I don't want to leave off my cities either, it's just that I work with the Sheriff, and the Sheriff's Office has been just a, an exceptional collaborative partner um, in trying to make our community safer. So I believe that my role as a county commissioner is to maintain and improve our quality of life. And every time I'm faced with a decision, I kind of look through that lens. Um, when I was elected, I noticed two things right off the bat, that we could improve, and those things would improve our quality of life. So panhandling. It's true that beggars standing on every major corner in my district stood out as a problem. But what I learned as a member of the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, and as a commissioner, that we had a bigger problem, and that was safety on our streets. Um, we are one of the most dangerous communities for pedestrian and bicyclist safety um, in the state, and I believe in the nation. Um, for those of you um, who would like some statistics, let me tell you that mo motor vehicle collisions with pedestrians increased 159% between 2017 and 2018. And fatal and major injuries um, with pedestrians and bicyclists increased 633% during that same time period. Now, for those of you who believe that panhandlers are homeless and just down on their luck, um, the nonprofits who work daily on this problem tell me that the homeless population um, is usually not the same as the panhandler population. They tell me panhandling is a job that pays better than most unskilled jobs. You don't have to pay taxes, you don't have to take drug tests, and it was legal. And that's why it became so popular. Um, now, another thing I'll tell you about me is that civil rights and protection of our freedom of speech are also very important things to me. And you know what else is important to me and to our Board of County Commissioners? And that's helping people who truly need help. Panhandling is not helping anyone. So Manatee County adopted an ordinance in October of 2019, and the primary focus was to increase public safety. Our county's attorney's office did a wonderful job of drafting the ordinance to make sure it's legally defensible and hopefully will improve public safety. Now let's talk about massage parlors. Who likes to get a massage? I like to get a massage. How many of you have to be buzzed in to the place, the front door, to get a massage because the front door is locked? I'm glad no one raised their hand. Does your massage therapist wear clothing? <laughs> Mine does. Um, once in the private room for a massage, do you find a bed instead of a massage table and the therapist then locks the door so no one can come in? No, probably not, right? Uh, what about the hours of operation? Is your massage therapist available 24-7? Usually not for a legitimate business. Okay, so as you might imagine, the places that we are regulating now are not really places that massage your tired muscles. The sheriff will tell you that they are organized crime centers um, from out of state and basically houses of prostitution. Why do I care? I'm not someone who's going to push my morality on anyone. <laughs> this is strictly about business for me. And these businesses are not only a weakness to District 4, but I viewed them as a threat of our efforts to improve the area. They affect property values. You know, I've talked to realtors who say, look, every time I drive someone down to show them a house and I pass one of those establishments, they say, ah, uh, no thanks. <laughs> I don't want to live in this neighborhood. Manatee County is investing a lot of money in the southwest area and we're trying to create value in this district and get the biggest bang for our dollars. We should all want that. Manatee County is also reinvesting our tourist development tax money that we get to, um, to drive tourism and tourism pays our bills, let's face it. When our visitors arrive at the beautiful Sarasota Bradenton International Airport, I don't want them to say, geez, let's go south to Sarasota because 
up there in Manatee County, you know, it's not so nice. And US 41, if you don't know, is an important gateway to Manatee County. The way it looks conveys to people what our quality of life is all about. So I want you to imagine yourself going up to the front door of a home, and that door is painted a beautiful bold color, and it has a shiny new doorknob on it, and a lock, and it's solid. And you, when you go up to that door, you feel happy and safe and ready to enter. But if that door is peeling paint and warped and has a scratchy old doorknob that doesn't work, you might not feel so good. And that's exactly what our gateway conveys to people. So these businesses, I believe, and these um, activities are diminishing our returns on investments. And that is the reason that the board unanimously approved an ordinance to regulate massage parlors. Thank you. That was entertaining, Misty. <laughs> I, my, my actual, my business, my store is in Misty's district. And I told one of the guys, I was like, can you move down a little bit further and stop bothering my customers? And he said, Ms. Bailey, what are you worried about? I come in here and spend money. So I was like, yeah, you're right. But I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not safe. And, and, and thank you for working on that. And thank you, Chief William Tolkacher. Give him a round of applause as he comes in. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. I'm with Holmes Beach. We have 17 sworn officers and 4,000 residents uh, that we police. Out of those residents, uh, I tell people all the time that we have the nicest residents in the world, but every day we have 10,000 people here, weekends, 20 to 30,000, holidays, 40,000 or more, uh, and they're not all welcome guests. We did have a reduction in crime this last year. Uh, we've had a reduction the last seven years that I've been there. I'm very happy with that, but like uh, uh, Chief Kramer said, you don't want to take all the accolades because sooner or later it's got to go up. Last year we had 49, seven years ago we had 152 UCR crimes, this year we had 42. So it did go down again, we're very happy with that. Uh, 38 of those are larcenies, so that's where the education is going out, where we put up our signs telling people to lock it or lose it, uh, make sure you lock your doors, uh, don't walk to your trunk and put your stuff in the trunk when you get to the beach, do that beforehand. Uh, so you're not just letting everybody know that, hey, all my valuables are there, or leaving them uh, on your front seat. Uh, you know, breaking the window and pushing a button opens your trunk. So, you know, you've got to be careful with that. We did have a reduction in our burglaries this year. Uh, we went down by seven burglaries, very happy with that. And that's from educating our public and our house watch program that we do, where we watch your house when you go out of town. A little bit of statistics for you. Everybody's asked, I get calls all the time, why don't you uh, have your police officers direct traffic at the traffic lights on the weekends and holidays? And I tell them, we have three lights. That would be three officers. That's what we have on for the entire shift is three officers. We have a sergeant and two officers. And if we were to want to do that, then we would have to coordinate with the Coast Guard and get them to stop putting up the bridge every 30 minutes. We would have to get Bradenton to man 70, uh, 75th and Manatee, 67th, 51st, 59th, all of those because we are just directing traffic into a traffic jam. You're not going to move anybody with the rolling roadblock of the trolley, which does a great job, but they stop you know, every your quarter mile and stop traffic. So uh, those are things that we have to deal with. Uh, people talk about park and ride, and that's a great idea if the park and ride is going to get the people out to the island faster. But are you going to leave the comfort and uh, your car, the air conditioning of your car with all the things that you're bringing to the beach if you're just sitting in traffic like you would be in your car? So we've discussed having some type of a ride system or something where it gets the vehicles out there faster, but I don't see anything like that happening in the near future. Uh, I've asked them about the bridge uh, that's talked about getting replaced, and that's like seven to 10 years out. So even if we work on getting a separate lane for some type of a shuttle, that's not gonna get you there any faster. Couple of numbers for you. In November, we had 623,650 vehicles that came onto Holmes Beach. 
in December, 617,000. Those numbers are not as drastic to think about as our license plate recognition tells us that in November we had 10,394 hits for people that came on the island with suspended licenses, uh, stolen vehicles, wanted for arrest, uh, tag being no good. That's a lot of violators that are coming out to the island. You know, so just like I said, not everyone that comes out is a welcome guest. So thank you guys, appreciate being here. Thank you so much, Chief Tokager. Next, we will have Captain Lorenzo Waiters. Please give him a round of applause as he comes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Before I get started, I just want to thank uh, your department and your department for your panhandling um, ordinance because they're in Palmetto now. Okay? <laughs> And we do require ours to take a drug test. So I just want you to get that out of the way. On behalf of uh, Chief Scott Tyler, he sends his regards. He's at another luncheon at our police department with Bridging the Gap, and so he couldn't be here, so he sent the next best me. <laughs> so uh, our department is comprised of about 35 sworn officers. That's including the chief and the, and the two captains. Um, let's see, our crime was down 6% uh, last year. And as you know, the police department will be, or the city will be building a new police department uh, sometime next summer is when they'll start construction. Uh, we're also starting a marine unit. The boat should be here by the spring. So those are the things that are occurring in the city of Palmetto. I don't have all that. I don't count cars like you do. You know, that's just too much. Am I under five minutes? You can. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> he told me he was going to do that, but I'm a stickler for time, but my goodness. <laughs> Next, we have up um, Sheriff Rick, Rick Wells. Please give him a round of applause as he comes up. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, thank you all for having me. It's always a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I wish that I could be like Chief Tokinger and only have 49 UCR reportable crimes and have my main concern be making sure the sea turtles made it to the water. I, I wish I had that because that's, that's important. But you do, you do a great job with that. Uh, that would be a great. I, I have over. 533 sworn deputies in the county. We uh, have 279 deputies that work just in corrections. We handle the jail for, for all of the agencies. Uh, we handled uh, close to 363,000 calls for service last year, uh, roughly 992 calls per day. Uh, that's a, a, a big difference than when I started here in 1984. Uh, things have changed. Uh, we serve uh, close to 300,000, 300, over 300,000 residents now in the unincorporated area of Manatee County. Uh, I think you heard last year when our county administrator, Sherry Corrier, you know, told us what we already knew that you know we had a, a large population, close to 400,000 people, and we feel that that every day. And she's been great to to, to work with. We had a 7.3 decrease in, in crime, um, and and when we say that, it, that's it's very difficult to compete against last year's numbers, and that's what we're doing with UCR. So every year we're competing against last year's numbers. So in order to have a decrease. We have to continue to, to fight hard um, to make sure that we are doing everything possible to deter crime. Um, but I am happy to say, along with, with Lorenzo and, and, uh, and Josh and, and Bill, that we are definitely seeing a reduction in burglaries, and, and especially vehicle burglaries. And that's, I, I believe that's just because of the constant education of trying to help people to remember that's very important to remove your personal belongings. And we have cars that are left open um, that have laptops and 
guns and wallets and sometimes keys. So we have a vehicle burglary and then we have a stolen vehicle at the same time. And, and I would just caution you to always remember that if your garage door opener is in your vehicle and it's in the driveway and you leave that door open, then that, they now have access to your home. So it, it's very important that we remind one another. It, we have a lot going on every day, and, and I get that. Uh, we served well over 3,000 warrants last year, so the Manatee County Sheriff's Office serves every warrant in the county. So if BPD or Holmes Beach or Palmetto, if they have a warrant uh, that was issued by one of their officers, we serve that warrant, uh, no matter where it's at in the entire county. Uh, our CPS, Child Protective uh, Division, uh, handled over 5,000 investigations last year uh, dealing with child neglect, child abuse, issues that involve our children in this community. Uh, that, that to me is overwhelming at times. If, if, if there's anything that, that uh, gives me uh, you know, nightmares at night and keeps me awake, it's, it's, it's our children in this community and the way that they are treated. And, and the opioid and heroin uh, epidemic has a lot to do with that. A lot of the kids that, that we deal with that we have to try to remove from homes is unfortunately because the, their parents are addicted to, to drugs and they just can't take care of them. So, uh, you know, we work very hard on trying to reunite and, and give those parents the, the help that they need, but it's not always successful. Um, we do... Uh, take the epidemic very seriously, even in the jail. So we always talk about we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem, and we won't. We never will. It's, it's, it, it was uh, it's not a concept that it, anyone should have even talked about, even during the 80s. It's not going to happen. If, when there is a demand, the supply will always be there. We have to fund treatment and education, but treatment is critical. When they do get arrested, and that's usually for property crimes that they commit trying to support their habit, we have two recovery pods in the jail, and we start the, the healing process there. Uh, the 12-step program, we bring in faith base, and we do what we can to try to, to help them through this addiction and then help them re-enter our community and get to where they need to be. And we've been very successful with that. And uh, even though we're not center stone and we're not a treatment program, we really have had great success. And, and that that's probably one of the, the greatest joys that I have when I, people come to me and they see me in the public and they tell me how much the recovery pod has helped them. So um, the other big issue, I'm sure you all have not seen this very much, is traffic. Uh, we work a lot more traffic crashes now than we ever had before. We work about 200 traffic crashes a month. That's because the highway patrol is just not able to staff uh, here in Manatee County and Sarasota County. They just don't have the troopers that they used to. So we have to pick up the slack because we can't afford to have uh, a person waiting three, four, five, six hours sometimes for a trooper to to show up. So we, we pick up that. We try to help them as much as we can. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll... Uh, get what they, they, they will get what they need so we can continue to patrol their neighborhoods. That's where we want to be. Thank you all. Thank you to all of our panelists. Would you please give them a round of applause for coming out today? Now for our questions and our answers. Um, to ask a question, you must be a member of the Manatee Tiger Bay Club. To become a member, you can see Elaine, and she will take your $100, and then you can ask your question. Give us your name once you come to the microphone. If you are a member, and state your question, and to which speaker you would like to direct your question to. Members, to allow everyone a chance to ask their question, you are limited to only 30 seconds. Only ask. Do not elaborate. <laughs> if you have a question, you can step up here and we will begin our questions. But our first question will go to our law enforcement. With Black Lives Mattering, Blue Lives Matter, Everyone Lives Matter. Could you all please tell me with the arising tension with racial 
conflicts across the United States and different communities. How are we handling this here in our own town? How do we prepare for our racial tensions? We may not want to talk about it, but I know we have to prepare for it. Any one of my law enforcement officers may come up first. Thank you so much. First is educating the officers to how you want them to respond to people. And the next thing is transparency. When something is said uh, that's brought to your attention, you need to investigate it. You need to be transparent with the community as to your findings. So. I'll tell you from being in law enforcement for close to 40 years, uh, times have changed. And we know that racism is out there. But I would tell you that the majority of law enforcement officers, it, it, you know, I can speak for this county because I worked over there. And uh, for our agency is that nobody wakes up and wants to violate anybody's rights. Nobody wakes up to shoot anybody. We don't do that. Uh, I'll tell you that our agency is a service-based uh, policing. And basically what that is is that we treat everybody in the community as a customer. Now, we don't want repeat customers, <laughs> but we still treat everybody as a customer. So, and we push that down from the chief all the way down to the uh, clerk inside of records. Everybody does that. And uh, I'll tell you, sometimes we have to stop and listen to what people are saying. And sometimes it's, uh, it's when, things that people aren't saying, we have to listen. And I think if we can do that, and like you said, with education, I think we can uh, resolve our issues. As Chief Tobitcher said, the biggest for us is transparency. We uh, get complaints anonymous. Uh, people want to give their names. It doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to investigate it. We're going to investigate it fully. That may not mean that we're going to give you an answer tomorrow. We have to be fair. There's due process just as any, uh, anyone else is afforded due process. Officers are afforded due process. Um, but we, we do not sugarcoat things when uh, bad information comes out and we investigate it, we report it. Uh, we take the black eye and we move on because the black eye will heal. Uh, as far as uh, community involvement is really what we look at to help uh, ease that tension. Um, the deposits we make in those relationships pay the dividends when you need to come back and ease the tension uh, because of an incident. And knock on wood, there have not been any incidents here really recently. Um, by doing that, we a lot of times we have their designated organizations within the community, but uh, every community has leaders either formal or informal, that uh, really are recognized sometimes by our agency, but more, offer, more often by our officers who work the neighborhoods who we can go to and say, who in that neighborhood is really the person we can talk to to help ease these tensions? Thank you. I'd say I would to what Josh just stated it's important that we're in the community every single day and we, and we try to do that and uh, we try to build relationships and, and to, to to help make changes when times are good it's not always easy um, and, and what I tell the deputies is that you know we can be in the community every day for five years and we can be doing a lot of good things and we can be helping people it only takes one one bad incident, one, one deputy, one officer to really ruin uh, what we've done in five years. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had the uh, um, misfortune of having to arrest, file charges, and, and fire officers before because of excessive force and what I uh, believe is racism. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's doing the right thing, so we try to do the right thing all the time. But you know, social media doesn't help. Uh, you know, a lot of times the facts are not able to come out before uh, one side or the other is already being hammered for something that's not even true. So we try to get the facts out there as quickly as we can, and then you know, people can you know, make a, 
uh, make their own opinion on, on what they believe took place. But uh, it's, it's, always, it's always in the forefront. We always have to be working in the community. But uh, unfortunately, some, someone will, will mess that up for us, and we have to work even harder. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for answering that question. Much appreciated. Next. Hello, my name is Kay White, um, and I am a Tiger Bay member. And I would like to, first of all, thank all of you for putting your life on the line for us every day. We are grateful to you. Uh, my question is, <laughs> I've heard there's a move to incorporate a homeless uh, outreach team uh, in Manatee County. Um, like to know what that's going to be comprised of, organizations, individuals, and what is the objective. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. I was going to talk about that earlier, but I got So when we were talking about panhandling and the homeless, um, I feel very strongly that we don't, we don't do enough to help the homeless. I mean, we have organizations in place, but collectively as a group, we had to do more. What we have tried to do, and, and I just approved this pamphlet uh, this morning, um, is we're trying to follow what Sarasota has been doing for the last uh, few years. And we have a team of, of deputies uh, that go out with the uh, services that are in Mantee County. We go out to these different uh, camps where we know homeless people are living. And we, we just want to make sure they understand that there are services out there for them. And if we have to get, you know, get them to the people that can help them, and uh, you know, so there's, there's really it's something that we just started uh, here, uh, just the last couple of weeks, and we just got these pamphlets. We we, we want to give them information now, whether or not they want those services, you know, that's another thing. But we want to at least try to get them uh, the information they need, and if nothing else, uh, so many of them are addicted to. Uh, substance, uh, alcohol, or whatever, we want to try to get them the help they need to, to you know, hopefully fight that addiction as well. So we have a long way to go. Um, I think we can do a lot more. Housing is a big issue. Uh, we just don't have a lot of room for them to even stay when it's the other night, when it's 30 degrees outside. You know, the Salvation Army only has so many uh, beds available. So we're, we're working with everyone to try to make that uh, uh, easier on them and hopefully get get them the help they need. Thank you for that question and I'd like to add just a little more information. Um, so our board has been very interested in looking at opportunities to help the homeless as well. And one of the things that our board agreed on is that this year we would like to fund a position that will help to coordinate all of the efforts that help the homeless. Um, I am someone who sits on the Suncoast Partnership uh, Board to End Homelessness. It's personally a very important topic to me as I've had a family member who is homeless. And so yes, don't misunderstand any of the regulation as not being um, compassionate towards people who need help. And we do have a lot of homeless people who need help. As the sheriff mentioned, um, Sarasota has a very a strong homeless outreach team. Uh, we've sent our officers down to see what they do, uh, what, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, again, it's partnering with the organizations in the community that help uh, that, that population. Um, we do have officers who serve as liaisons with uh, the various community organizations uh, right now. Uh, we actually reached uh, or received a, I think we're now year three, of a uh, grant which helps for at least a temporary temporary solution for people who come and have a, a need. We're able to help them out with uh, housing for a few weeks um, or get them back to where they wanted to go. If they don't want to be homeless here or they have family or friends somewhere else, they're able to uh, go back and be reunited there. You know, when dealing with homeless, um, sometimes we have to stop and, and ask ourselves or tell ourselves, you know, we don't know what their circumstances are and why they're here. Uh, some of them do have drug problems. 
some of them are veterans suffer from PTSD, and then um, you have some that have some type of mental illness. And as I said earlier, uh, sometimes we have to stop and listen. And what I mean by that is uh, don't treat them any differently than you would treat anybody else. And that's the word that we send to our officers. Uh, we go out and we speak with the homeless, see what their needs are, and if we can help them, we'll help them. We work closely with turning points. We work closely with the health department. Uh, if you remember a while back, uh, we had a uh, hepatitis C, C? outbreak, and uh, we took on the task of going out and speaking with the homeless and going to homeless camps and uh, offering uh, them the vaccine. So uh, that is what we're doing in the city of Hamado. Uh, Kevin Wright, and I'm a member. This question is for Mrs. T and any of the law enforcement that would like to reply. I am a reformed serial uh, lead foot driver. And having lived and driven in almost every state in the union, I was an easy catch at speed traps in many, many states across the United States. Uh, and so in some of the cities I went by, they were relatively crime free. But one of, the rel one of the main incomes there was the speed traps where I, I contributed to their funds and to the salaries of the law enforcement officers that, that stopped me. Uh, at least there was a human being that was issuing me those traffic citations uh, and depriving me of my property, my money. Uh, how do you reconcile red light cameras, uh, which are not human beings, to, which are potentially depriving folks like me of our, of our property uh, as, uh, as being a, if you're a business person, red light cameras are a great deal. The profit margin for red light cameras are huge. That's yeah. one of the reasons why they bring in so much money for folks. How do we separate that profit motive uh, from law enforcement? Because I think most people would agree that that's not a good motivation. You good? <laughs> you good? <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm not sure I really understand the question. Oh, how do I reconcile? Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about red light cameras. Um, they were voted on and decided before I ever had a vote, so that wasn't something that I implemented. But here's what I understand. Um, I have been to the sheriff's substation where a certified deputy sits at a desk all day long and he views video of people who may or may not have run a red light, and he makes a decision whether or not the law was broken. And if the law was broken, he issues a citation, okay? We pay somebody to do that. It's also my understanding that this is not a money-making business. This is something in place to help make our community safer. So if you don't want a ticket for running a red light, don't run a red light. Um, I will tell you, I am guilty in the past of thinking, well, it's yellow, let's go. Now my way of thinking is, it's yellow, I'm gonna stop. So it has changed my behavior. I hope it's changed other behaviors. And I will ask our sheriff if he wants to comment further. Thank you. I know this is a highly controversial topic, and, and we understand that. So, you know, what what I and it, this everything that has been in place. My my main concerns early on, before I was even sheriff with red light like cameras, is is the right turn. I don't like the right turn um, component of um, of the cameras, and I wanted to make sure that the lights themselves were sequenced correctly. I, I believe there's things that you can do. You can uh, leave the yellow light on longer or whatever. I can tell you we do have a deputy. And, and, he, and so he looks at every single violation that the camera sends to our server. Um, and we make a determination if it's close uh, we we don't we, you know we don't send the citation. Um, it it helps us and, and think of it like this: if you are hit by a red light runner at any intersection in Manatee County and there are no witnesses, uh, there's going to be no charges filed. 
If you don't have someone that can say that you or I ran the red light at the time of that collision, then we can't make a determination uh, on who's at fault. Uh, red light cameras has helped us with those type of cases, especially for court, where we can show that this is the person who actually committed the uh, traffic offense. Um, other than that, you know, I mean, I, I, can we can we do without them? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I, I I would rather have a camera there so I could at least make a charge on someone who just blew a red light and killed someone, and we've had several of those. Home speech, we don't have red light cameras, but when I was with Bradenton, I had calls from people that asked, where are your red light cameras? And I would go, what is your question? And they said, we want to know what red lights we have to stop at. It's like, every red light you have to stop at. Okay, I've got a little flyer for Holmes Beach. It's, a, it's on our website, and it's how to save money while vacationing in Holmes Beach. Number one is you can save $166 by wearing your seatbelt. Stopping at stop signs, stopping at red lights, all of those will save you money. If you don't want a ticket for these things like speeding, don't speed. You know, it's simple as that. I've been doing this for 41 years. I got my start from Henry Blyden right over there. He was my recruiter that got me in the Army Military Police. And I tell people all the time, you don't want tickets, don't do the violation. If you do, don't come to me and say, hey, your guy gave me a ticket, can you do something? I tell them all the same thing, pay the ticket or take it to court. When a politician comes to me and says, hey, is there anything you can do? I can say, anything you want to do to help them, you can, as long as you're the one paying it, because I'm not voiding it. <laughs> uh, the city of Bradenton did have red light cameras. Uh, we did away with them a few years ago. Uh, one of the reasons was it seemed like a com couple of them were, had gone away from being the safety issue. We weren't having the collisions at that intersection to then becoming a revenue maker. Um, that really wasn't the, that wasn't the purpose behind it. 15th of Manatee, I think everybody knows that one. Um, there, was, there wasn't enough justification for that. Uh, 9th and uh, 3rd Avenue? I think there should be another one right now because it's a very dangerous intersection. The sheriff touched on this earlier about the number of crashes that they work. On an average, we work at least three crashes going south on 41 across the DeSoto Bridge in the morning and uh, at least two to three more in the afternoon and everybody's coming home. So, Pamela doesn't have red light cameras, uh, but I'll tell you this. Any tool that we can use in law enforcement to minimize the number of crashes and to save lives, uh, we should be able to use. Now, having been a father that has lost somebody in the crash, has lost a uh, child in the crash, I, uh, think it's important that either what tool we use or you all, if you see something that's consistently where somebody's speeding, driving recklessly, that you call us and let us take care of it. Thank you. Captain Waiters, you said you were in the department for 40 years. So they hired you when you were six years old? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I am uh, Dr. Jim Whitman. I am a member of Tiger Bay and a winner of the coveted Tiger by the Tail Award. Mm. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this question is directed primarily to Sheriff Wells. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist. I was the psychiatrist for the Manatee County Jail for many years before there was a recovery pod. I'm very pleased to hear about that. My question is, are, have you uh, incorporated this new uh, long-acting injectable uh, uh, medication called Vivitrol, uh, which uh, is an a inhibitor of, of uh, narcotics, prevents you from getting high? And uh, I'm working now at Leon County. They have a Vivitrol clinic in the community 
it's where they can do that. I don't know if that's if, if Center Stone is doing that, but I'd be very curious to know if that's part of the plan. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, sir. We, we, we started that program um, last year, uh, we have, and we have a new um, uh, health provider in the jail now, NAPCARE, and, and not only, so we're, yeah, yeah so we, we, we're trying to enhance that as well. We're also, we're, we're enhancing the, um, the mental health side of uh, corrections and making sure that the people are in there with true mental illness are not put in general population, but they also have um, th their needs met and they have the, and they have the, the, the correct uh, type of doctor in there dealing with some of the issues they have. And, um, you know, we're, just, we're trying to do what we can. There's, there's a lot of people in jail that uh, here locally that don't need to be there. We need to make sure that they don't come back. Got it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Xavier wanted me to talk real briefly about the texting law. I know none of y'all text while you're driving, so it may be a waste <laughs> of time. But we're going to talk real <laughs> briefly about what you can and cannot do. So when you are driving, uh, the car is in drive, you're in motion, uh, the law now makes it a moving violation if you are observed by a law enforcement officer texting as you're going down the road. Um, that's a lot harder, to be honest with you, uh, to view than people would think. You can still use your GPS. You can still talk on the phone, but if you're texting and there's, and the officer knows that, which is, I mean, I guess they would have to see you actually moving your fingers. It's really, really hard. Um, you can be pulled over for that. But here's what maybe you don't know and what you should know. When you're in a construction zone, or in the school zone. You cannot use your phone at all, okay? It can't, you can't talk, you can't look at it, you can't throw it at your kids, you just, you've got, I mean, it can't be in your hand. It's construction zone and school zones. You gotta use wireless, so Bluetooth or whatever. That, that's important because that's easy. When the texting bill was first introduced uh, to the, Senate back a couple years ago, it was introduced as a total hands-free bill all the time for all of us. And it got worked as they always do to just the texting. So I wouldn't be surprised here in, in the next two or three years we don't see a, a hands-free uh, bill come through there where we have to use a Bluetooth device at all times. Any questions on that? Thank you. I really needed to answer for myself, so. <laughs> thank, you, thank you all. Please give all of our panelists a round of applause. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you again to our law enforcement and everything you do and putting your lives on the line for our community. Um, we really appreciate you. Um, thank you to all that attended today to our luncheon. Thanks to all of our speakers once again. Um, may I have my board member stand, please, if you are here. Just stand, 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 please. Thank you so much. So. All of you know that this is an election year, so we did it a little bit different. So the next two months we'll be hitting on the $15 minimum wage, open primary, and voter security. Um, we will start our first debate. We put together a, de a debate committee this year um, to make it a little bit fair so no one's being accused of being too conservative or whatever it might be. So we have a little bit of everything on this debate committee. Our co-chairs are Joe Ash and Steve Vernon. So if you are interested and you are a member of Tiger Bay, you may join this debate committee. Your job is going to come up with the questions. We're going to go through the questions and we will select the questions for our candidates. Our first debate will be April and that will be for the County Commission District 5 seat and that will be Vanessa Baugh and Ed Hunziker. And I think the May debate will be between 
um, Lisa Chittero and Ed Broski. So we've already trying to kind of get these together for you all. And if, if there is a particular race that you would like to see, please let us know. Um, and we really want you all to come out and please, please come out and be informed. We want you to make the best decisions. Um, thank you all um, for your membership. If you know, if you have not joined yet, please see Elaine. It's $100 for your membership. Members and guests, if you know someone who might be interested in upcoming topics, please invite them as your guests and they can send Elaine also the, that information. If you are interested in submitting a topic and speakers, please submit that to Elaine. Elaine, raise your hand so they know who you are. <laughs> She does everything. <laughs> Pier 22 provided our complimentary valet parking for our luncheons. Thank you to METV for taping and broadcasting our forum today and ABC7 WWSB News team for attending and covering today's luncheon. Bradenton Herald and the Sarasota Herald Tribune. Please have a great day and thank you for attending. Mm -hmm.